What do you do when you're running a business that's hemorrhaging money with absolutely no end in sight? You go LTT 2.0, hardcore mode. What are you guys doing still sleeping? Come on, let's get a move on. The Labs team in logistics has been hard at work getting everything set up here at Lab 2. And while I haven't given you guys an update in a while, that's all the more exciting things for me to share with you today. There's power to the PSU tester, our laser keyboard scanner is working, we've got a metal 3D printer, we've got a brand new RF chamber behind me on those four pallets, and there is so much more for me to show you today. I'm so, so excited. Excited to tell you about our sponsor. XSplit. XSplit is a software company that provides simple but effective broadcasting and video production tools for live streaming. Their programs work with your favorite platforms like Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook, and you can check them out today and use code LINUS for 69% off your first purchase or subscription. Nice. None of the cool stuff we're doing happens without the people, so our tour begins in Deskland. The lab is already up to nine people and we've got room for up to a dozen more in spite of the fact that it has generated no revenue whatsoever. But who needs revenue when you've got cool stuff like this? You've already met our keyboard testing robot Cave, but Cave has got a mustache. I mean, 3D laser profiler. With this add-on, Cave can not only find the exact location of every key on the keyboard in order to uh, do his actuation testing, but he can handle whoop, keyboards in all kinds of different sizes and shapes. Jake Danes will show us. So this is that keyboard over there? Yep, that's right. This is the drop control, and this is the 3D point cloud that we generate with the laser profiler. So cool. So we've got exact height data for every part of this keyboard, which allows us theoretically then to nail dead center every single key. Well, it's not just the height data. Before we had the camera system, mm -hmm. and that has lens distortion, which meant on the edges of the keyboard, we were a little out on either side. With this, we actually do a sweep across the entire keyboard on a single axis, so we have exact positional data. It's not just the height, it's also the X and Y position. Cool. I know you guys are eager for us to start publishing and it must feel like we're just not doing anything over here, but that's not the case at all. It's just way more important for us to find these edge cases where we might be out a little bit, pun intended, ha 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 ha, uh, than for us to just start dumping data out into the world. For another example of the importance of professionalism, here is our totally legit IP testing chamber column. Don't make that face. This was your idea. The, I not, did not propose this. The gaffer tape is not my idea. Oh, well, I mean, he didn't have a way for me to lower the phone in, so I had to improvise. Not yet. But the point is that this is how we are going to test manufacturers' claims about the waterproofness of their phones. I don't know if this one is actually IP68 rated. You just dropped it six feet. Oh. Well, Maybe pull it back up. You should bring, how about three feet? Yeah, three feet. Three IP feet should seven. be good. Yeah. Cool. Uh, anywho, can you explain why we did this instead of like the fancy professional one? Well, if we got a custom tank made, effectively what we need is six feet de of depth. Right. Because pressure is all about the height of the water column above the device. Sure. It would have been $4,500, five grand, or $800. This novelty children's light from AliExpress. And it's not from AliExpress, it's from Amazon. It's actually from a very reputable company in the UK. Uh, it's a children's sensory toy. What do you think are the odds this thing still works? Um, it depends on the IP rating and whether or not Google's being truthful, which I is, I guess, what we're going to find out. Yeah. I don't even know. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, hey. It still turns on. It still works. I mean, that doesn't mean it will still work. Uh, a little bit of distilled water is not going to immediately oh, kill it. Oh, that's not distilled. Oh. What's the plan then? We put moisture sensors inside the phone and then we put it in and we monitor it. It's a semi-destructive test. Manufacturers claim that you can submerge your device for X amount of time at a certain depth. And We're so testing it's just that. Pass fail, and if it's it pass fail, breaks, if they're lying, then I'd get to buy another phone, or or more. Okay. It's not my money. Did I mention there's no revenue yet? The space in between the rows of test benches is a bit of a long story. There's gonna be the shelves here, which is pretty much an inbox for these folks, everything that is to be tested. And then the actual width of this space was a miscommunication because they thought we needed a bunch of space for lighting in between, but I actually want the lab to be all about testing, testing, testing. So we're probably gonna either shove this one in or shove that one over this way to make room for more people. Meanwhile, hi. Nick here is sitting in desktop component testing land and he's working on something, uh, oh, that we cannot talk about yet, but I'm sure is really cool. Very cool. Very cool. 
Nick works on our internal benchmarking software called MarkBench, and it has evolved a lot since the last time you guys got a look at it. What can it do now? More games? Yep, we, uh, we have some more games that we can cover. That's a lot of games. Correct. Uh, we can most... do not games. <laughs> Most of the improvements are actually in our data visualization and prototyping of data analysis in the back end. So there's not too much to show on the screen. But you guys have complained about our graphs many, many, many times over the years. And one of Nick's top priorities for the first couple of quarters this year is to help the rest of the team figure out how to make that whole process A, more automated, and B, easier for you guys to read. Can I ask about this? Uh, yeah, that's Gary's assignment while we wait for benchmarks to complete. He says coloring inside the lines creates discipline. Well, I obviously don't have any <laughs> crap. Here at the end of desktop testing land is going to be our new RF chamber, which, as it turns out, is not going to use any of the components from the original blue chamber at all. So that is all just going to be stuffed into the walls of our acoustic chamber, I think. Yeah, right? that's yeah. the plan. And that's, that's it. So we're essentially going to shred it. But that's fine because we have a brand new RF chamber that is worth somewhere on the order of $200,000. Oh no, that's just the foam. What, that's just the foam? Oh yeah. No, no it's, it's, it's about a half mil. Cool. Uh, the foam is from TDK, who I really only knew as like maker of blank DVDs, but apparently they do a lot of other stuff. Cost aside, my understanding is that the new chamber is like way better than the old one because this is better foam or something. Yeah, so the frequencies that this is attenuated to yeah. is much wider than the old foam. It's brand new. It's, you know, it's not in a heap of garbage. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the way that this is gonna work is we're actually gonna have to have walkway panels because this is gonna coat the floor, ceiling, and walls. Oh. So it's gonna be fully anechoic uh, within the RF spectrum that we're testing. So uh, Raymond EMC, they're, uh, they're a Canadian company. They're, they've been awesome. Uh, they're working with us on this. Uh, we should hopefully have it built by May. Okay. And yeah, they're, uh, they've been great to work with. Shout out Raymond DMC. Actually, everyone who's helped us get the lab set up has been so enthusiastic just about there being this testing for consumers. It's been kind of whatever the opposite of disheartening is. It's been heartening. Heartening. Yeah, it's been, it's yeah. been heartening to see how many people just want there to be independent testing for consumers. That doesn't mean all this crappy blue foam is going to be wasted though. The space that I'm standing in right now is going to be our audio isolation chamber where we'll be able to get accurate acoustic measurements of everything from graphics cards to laptops to freaking I don't know, we could do an air conditioner if we really wanted to, I guess, right? Yeah, we could. Basically anything. And to beef up its design, we're gonna be using a dual shelled construction. So we're going to have obviously good acoustic foam on the inside, but in between the walls, we need some kind of filler. And that's where you come in, loser. Then next to the audio isolation room, we're gonna have, what about second audio isolation room? This is going to be a home theater. So while we could use that chamber to test things like headphones and small consumer electronics, if we wanna test something big like tower speakers, you need not only a properly isolated room, but a large enough room that it will be an accurate representation of the kind of space that that product is intended to be used in. This room will also be lighting controlled so we can test everything from projectors to TVs to, I mean, I guess we could do monitors in here in a pinch? Yep. Would we just do monitors in here all the time? Probably. Okay, probably. Everything I've talked about so far is scheduled to be done either this quarter or in the next. But as we move into the second half of the year, we're obviously going to keep building. And I'm standing now in what is going to be our camera testing room. This is gonna be a super cool space. We don't need noise isolation here, but we absolutely need lighting control. And we're gonna have all kinds of everything from test patterns to interesting things that move around to uh, camera shake simulating rigs and all kinds of neat stuff, but that's gonna take some time. As you can tell, there's clearly still a lot more to sort out in the move. Like this guy needs to be unpacked. This is our metal 3D printer. And I have to confess, I actually don't know a ton about how these work. That's exciting. That's why Tim's here. We're gonna learn. Uh, we can't actually show you a whole lot of it because a lot of it is trade secrets. Oh. And we have an agreement with Rapidia that we can't show that. However, we can talk about how it works. So this okay. thing is gonna take some really cool compressed metal particulate and it's going to heat it up and it's going to lay it in lines just like you would a normal 3D printer. Sure. And it's gonna just kind of halfway solidify. It's gonna harden a little bit and then we take that part and we put it in this guy. 
the sintering oven. And this evacuates all of the air and it adds a whole bunch of argon gas and then it basically pulls a vacuum so that the, uh, the heat, the energy uh, that the oven creates is not wasted. It's uh, at a much lower pressure. It can get much hotter for the same amount of energy. Okay. And I guess that uh, that energy consumption is why we have this sitting next to the electrical panel here? Basically, yeah. This is a temporary home while we renovate the workshop over at the other unit. We have a project coming up soon, uh, the all-metal PC. Uh, Alex and I are really stoked to see what this thing can do to try and make things like fan blades and, and all sorts of water cooling equipment out of metal. But stuff that we've designed. This is nuts. That is nuts. Yeah. How does this handle overlays? Is it going to be like a standard 3D printer where you have to make supports or is it going to be like an SLS where you could just have a cavity inside a part if you want and you just like wash it away or... So that's really interesting. Because of the fact that we're printing with metal, you can't just take a set of pliers and like pull away at the supports after it's been through the center. Uh -huh. uh, the fact is that we would have to actually cut those through with a drill or with a machine of some other sort. So what you want to do is design your part in a different way. There's a, there's a different set of processes that you need to go through for checks and balances to make sure that you are not creating something that you can't use. It needs a name. We need a name. What are we going to name it? Uh, um, um, Ash, he's the champion. Okay. We're and gonna also fire. Or I guess that should be Ash then. That's Ash? And Ketchum. Ash and Ketchum. I don't know, sure. I, I'm not good at this. <laughs> Now I'm standing in what is apparently the lounge where people lounge and have meetings. Um, I asked, hey, is this temporary? Because a bunch of couches in the middle of the warehouse doesn't really seem like the most efficient use of space. And I was told, no, in fact, this is permanent and they don't care that every square foot of this cost something to the tune of about 610 Canadian dollars. Thankfully, the usefulness per unit squared of other areas will be a little bit higher. I'm standing in what's going to become an LTT filming set of some sort so that we don't have to truck everything over from the lab to the studio in order to make videos if we're in a hurry. And then over here is our power supply tester, which you've met before, but is now finally actually wired up so chroma can come and train us on it and an environmental chamber which will do both temperature control and humidity control so being next to the power supply tester you guys can probably imagine that we are going to test power supplies in it but we could use it for just about anything like say for example if you wanted to know how the battery life of a phone changes depending on the environment that it's in this is exactly what you'd use or well what will be there right now it's just a broom and a squeegee and some hoses you might have noticed our oscilloscope is still missing, but I assure you we've ordered one now, finally, and we've spoken with Johnny of Corsair, formerly of Johnny Guru, about the best methodologies for testing the newest power supplies, and you can expect a really solid update on this in the near future. Here we'll have camera supplies and long-term storage, which, wait, storage? Yeah, what's the deal with all the storage at this place? I thought this is supposed to be a lab. Well, in talking to the logistics team, we determined that if the lab is going to have the vast majority of the in and out for products, if they're not here, it is going to be a gigantic hassle. So we decided to move our entire logistics department and all of our storage here to the lab to make things simpler. To give you some idea what I'm talking about, this is all the keyboards that Antoine has checked out right now for testing. Thanks a lot, Antoine. And this is a fraction of what we're going to be going through as new products continue to be released. So these shelves are for the lab. And then this is all our own internal inventory, which is currently being organized by the one and only Jamie. Hello. Row number one is going to be peripheral land then. So you got your keyboards, mice, headphones, headsets, all that good stuff. Then as we round this corner, the veneer of organization falls away to reveal Complete and utter chaos. Uh, we have some moving vlogs actually up on floatplane.com. They're exclusive over there if you guys want to check them out. We'll have that linked in the video description. But for now, hey, let's talk to the one and only Dan. Hey. What the devil are you working on and why is it important? You're uh, not testing that motherboard, are you? No. Wait, what no. is this? So XL was running a little bit slow, so I thought I'd build myself a workstation. Oh, shut up. This is like a dual socket workstation thing. What is it actually Xenon for? Gold. This is part of our new WAN show 100% uptime <laughs> system. So server grade, uh, no downtime ever again. Uh, ultra stable, RAID 1 on some uh, SSDs, A4000 for the video card because I need the video memory. 
a little bit over spec. We'll see if, how this performs. Maybe it's overkill, I don't know. Dan Space is one part diagnostic workstation, one part cinematic workstation. How the devil did you end up with that monitor? It's the only one we had. I used to use a single 1080p monitor. Mm. And one part electronics rework station. Anytime that something goes terribly, terribly wrong, it ends up on this desk and then either goes back to the manufacturer or Dan attempts to fix it, after which it gets sent to e-waste. No, I mean, if he fails, it goes to e-waste. <laughs> Sometimes he wins. This is pretty phenomenal too. These Bamboo Labs printers are amazing. Two of them are just hooked up to like gigantic spools and they're for printing things in bulk, like all the self-congratulatory trophies that Dan is apparently making with my filament. And this middle one is hooked up to four of these multi-filament spool units here. So it can actually print in 16 different materials and the whole thing gets changed over automatically and they are all accessible over the network. Even cooler than you think, these three over here are just kind of standard filaments. This one here actually has three spools of carbon fiber reinforced PA, which is super strong and basically indestructible. And then this one here is a washable support material. So you have supports and then you dunk it underwater and it all melts away. This aisle is going to be for PC DIY. This aisle is going to be for systems and consumer electronics. And then the aisle over there is going to be for bulky stuff like TVs along the bottom. And then anything that we put into our standardized workstations. Uh, so any inventory we keep for like, cases and stuff like that is just going to be all piled up there. You're probably wondering why we don't have another shelf above that. And the answer is very simple. That's as high as we're allowed to go with the sprinkler system in this building, unless we completely redesign the sprinkler system, which would cost a fortune. Wait, something's happening. This is our receiving bay. And what did we get? It looks like foam. It actually just looks like foam. Probably 20 grand right there. Is it what? No, shut up. There's, this can't be expensive foam. This is expensive foam? Yeah, what's inside is expensive. You're looking at the expensive protection for the expensive foam. Oh, this is the protection. What is it? Those are our walkway caps. Oh. Walkway caps. So, because the foam is on the floor, yeah. we have to be able to walk on something. Uh -huh. So these have been air freighted from Japan. Oh, well, That's where they're manufactured. So, this is what we're going to be walking on, have the desk set up on in the uh, 4G, 5G network. Next to the bay, we've got Angus from Accounting's couches that he didn't have anywhere to store, but he's definitely going to be taking away very soon. And what will go here is the procurement department. Right now, they're upstairs, completely separate from logistics, and having those departments together is hopefully going to smooth out a lot of communication challenges. Uh, you've already met Forky here. Wow, that's solid. And then we've also got our own cherry picker now, so we'll be able to take that down the aisles here and grab things and put them down and all that good stuff. Up here is we don't know land, maybe stuff that's to be sold, but I kind of said, gee, if we know we're getting rid of it, should we really be dragging it upstairs only so we can drag it back down? And they were like, yeah, that's a good point. We just don't know what else to put there. So <laughs> cool. Some plans haven't changed. In here, for example, is going to be the development team for the lab's website. And then I, oh, hey, Tim, is Gary's desk out there now? I don't think Gary has one. Gary doesn't have a desk? I don't think it's been approved yet. Okay, the plan here has changed though. This is now going to be a lunchroom slash lounge, which really raises the question of why they need another lounge out there, but I don't know. Realistically, at some point, we're probably gonna end up putting desks in here. I, you, know, you know how these things go. And then this is going to be for the Mac address team, which is a team now and not just Jonathan Horst. This is still the server room. Jake has been trying to figure out how to deal with the noise isolation problems that we're having in this room. So, uh, Basically, we don't have a solution unless, uh-oh, it looks like you're gonna propose something awful. Um, we're gonna try to rebuild the wall, if that's even possible. There's no insulation in that wall and it doesn't even go all the way up. So if we have servers running in here, the poor social media team who's gonna be on the other side is gonna end up with tinnitus. A little bit less social. Here's the room for the aforementioned social team, though with that transformer that sounds like it's mounted above the ceiling tile, I think the server room might be the least of their concerns in here. This is the worst room in the building, bar none. I'm sure if you told you know, the labs team and procurement and logistics, hey, you guys don't have to work in a warehouse anymore. You get to come into this room. They'd be like, nah, dog, I'm gonna keep my warehouse. Up here, the only real change is that instead of doing the desks like we painstakingly mapped out on the floor with masking tape, 
we have completely reconfigured the layout and it's gonna be like L's that face each other, like for Linus tech tips, L's. Actually, that's a T. All that's up here right now is some leftover stuff that Labs hasn't moved down into their workspace yet. Like, you know, just casual RTX 3090s and 4090s sitting around. The amount of gear in this place, it's like gear heaven. This is gonna be my office, couple call rooms, Luke's office, and that's it. Oh, no it isn't. Unfortunately, Sam's not here today, so I can't give you guys an exact rundown of everything you're looking at. But the important thing is our head and torso simulator is, oh my God, that's heavy. Okay, I'm not gonna move it. Is finally here so we can actually test headphones now. Yes, you've probably seen some of those results in our videos recently. This is gonna be Luke's office and Sam is gonna do all his work in one of the acoustically isolated chambers. And then we've got a brilliant plan for out here. Now, because of the building code, something, 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 sorry, Andy, we can't wall this in and we can't turn it into office space. This is technically warehouse mezzanine. But what we can do is we can get those little meeting pod self-contained things and just plonk a bunch of them down here. And after some rough measurements that we actually did today, cause that's an idea we came up with while I was here, credit to Jake, is that your idea? I think so, good idea. Um, we think we can get two six person meeting rooms and like two more single or dual person meeting rooms. Now, you guys are probably wondering, how on earth are we doing the networking for all this? Massive shout out Ubiquiti. I think we've got a total of four access points in the office and then another eight out in the warehouse, giving us full Wi-Fi 6 gigahertz. So Wi-Fi 6E coverage absolutely everywhere in this building. It is ripping fast, which you guys will have seen in the most recent upgrade video that I did for the Wi-Fi at my house. We're obviously gonna have to do some small renos here, just make it look kind of decent before we plunk those uh, meeting rooms down. Maybe put a bunch of foam here. <laughs> Maybe some improvements to the lighting. <laughs> oh, shout out Eaton too for all the, uh, like the cable channel that they're providing for the, the, the wi wiring that we're doing. They're yeah. giving us enough of it to go from over here all the way to the end and like out four times or something yeah. like that. Proper networking installed. Woo! I know, right? Crazy. Even the outside networking is done properly. We've got these Unify access reader things. Tech tips guy himself. Jake always changes my what name to stuff. It says the tech tips guy himself. And then we've also <laughs> got their, uh, what are these, Unify 6LR? Yeah. Yeah, so these long range access points out here are so we can have great Wi-Fi in the parking lot. No, just kidding. Uh, they're because our car chargers, which are there, 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 and there, can all be controlled so that they can be turned off at a certain time at night so we don't have people just like rolling into our parking lot in the middle of the night, charging their car on our electricity and then leaving. This is a perk for employees and only employees. Linusmediagroup.com slash jobs. Can we take a moment with all the good today to acknowledge what is terrible about this? What were they thinking with this color scheme? You've got brown, brown, other brown, and faded brown. Yeah, the fading isn't really doing it any favors. I freaking hate it. Just like I hate not telling you about our sponsor. Snooze. Having trouble sleeping? Snooze might be able to help you out. Did you know, because your brain keeps processing sounds when you're sleeping, any unnatural noise could potentially be affecting your sleep quality. Snooze aims to solve that problem with their line of white noise machines. With a real fan built in, Snooze delivers a consistent, natural, soothing sound of moving air without actually producing any airflow. You can adjust the volume and the tone of the white noise Snooze produces on the device itself or head over to the Snooze app for a bevy of customization options. The Snooze Pro model has a bunch of upgrades over the original Snooze, including improved build quality, smart plug compatibility, and a handy tone control knob on the top of the device. I have one of those too. With a 100 night happiness guarantee, why not give Snooze a try? Check out the Snooze Pro at the link below. This time, if you snooze, you don't lose. If you guys like this video, maybe go check out the first video we did right after we bought it, doing a walkthrough. It may look like chaos now, but I promise you it's improved a lot. <laughs>